September 18th. My special guest today is uh, a man who uh, perhaps one of the most in-demand uh, drummers on the New York scene today. Uh, he's recorded with a lot of people, played with a lot of people, and his name is Joseph Farnsworth. I'm going to be uh, talking to Joe in a minute here after we play some of his music. I'm in the process of setting up a few things here. Sorry about uh, going back and forth. Uh, next week, we're doing a special, we, I, am doing a special Christmas show featuring, um, whoop, where did that come from? Hold on a second here. Oh, boy. Sorry about that. A little rough start today. Okay. Back to where we were. So next week is uh, our special Christmas show uh, with um, featuring uh, some special recordings from the Mount Fuji Jazz Festival. So I hope you'll join me for that. And I'll talk more about uh, future shows uh, after I come back here. But right now, uh, before we really get started, well, we are getting started here uh, with Joe Farnsworth with... Uh, something he recorded with uh, one of his mentors, Harold Mayburn.
Hello, Joe. Well, hold on a second here. Take two. Hello, Joe. Hello, Brett. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. It's good to see your face in the place. Before we go deep into your story, Joe, um, you've played with a number of the masters over the years. I recorded and played with a number of masters. Why is Harold Mayburn special? Well, first of all, I got I got to uh, gather my thoughts because just watching him play uh, just brought in a flood of memories. Um, I met him in 1986, my first year at William Patterson College. What makes him so special is he, he, he cared so much about music. He cared so much about the history of the music. And he, he really cared so much about teaching and passing it on to youngsters. Uh, and when I was a youngster and him passing it along to me. And as you can see right there, he loved playing the piano. You know, he loved comping. That was his biggest thing. He he he, always, he said he would like maybe once in his life just play one gig like Tommy Flanagan because he loved Tommy so much. His main thing and he knew it was the comp and he loved it and orchestration on the piano. So what made him so special is that he had he had the biggest heart of, out of any man I knew. Yeah, he Harold was a, a very special giving man. Uh, just the fact that. Uh, he lived way out in Brooklyn, and to teach at William Patterson, which he did for 30 years, whatever it was, that trip on the subway and then the bus and then another bus, he was like, it was like a four-hour commute every single day. But he didn't, that, did, that didn't stop him. Uh, now, from a, you going to say something, Joe? No, that used to always bug me. I, I used to say, is there a piano student that could give this a ride home? I mean, I just couldn't believe it. Like, that should be part of the lesson. But you're right. He lived, when you say Brooklyn to your jazz lovers around the world, he was, like, at the edge of, like, he was way past JFK. So for a, to be at school at 10 o'clock in the morning, he'd probably have to get up at 4 in the morning. And he would be at school at 9 in the morning. And imagine him traveling five hours and his first ensemble's at 10 in the morning. And Cats were showing up late, and they lived right on campus. <laughs> Can you imagine what he must have felt seeing that? He's up at 4 in the morning to be there an hour early, and the students, you know, show up like at 10.05, and they live right on campus. It's, it's hilarious. Well, it's, it says about a lot about his devotion to the music and who Harold Mayburn was as a man, because Harold Mayburn not only was a master of the music, he was an incredible teacher. I mean, for many, many years at William Patterson, you know, Harold uh, left us last year. I put together a little documentary about him. Joe participated, some other people. And he really touched people very, very deeply. So uh, I'm glad that we can share some of Harold Mayburn today. Joe, you've worked with a number of the masters. Uh, you studied at William Patterson, or not William Patterson, but you studied with Alan Dawson, and Arthur Taylor. Uh, now, Alan Dawson, uh, those of us who are involved in the music, of course, know him very, very well over the years, and perhaps not as, as famous as Arthur Taylor. What can you share with us about what you learned from Alan Dawson? Well, um, before I got with him, I was listening to records, and at that point in my life, let's say 1981, I was listening to uh, Sonny Payne, Max Roach, Buddy Rich, and uh, I was getting into Weather Report. And I bought this Weather Report record called Lockia. And it was different than Weather Record 830, you know, the more popular one. Live in Tokyo was a one of the earliest ones with, uh, I think it's Alphonse Moussan on drums. And uh, is Miroslav Vitas on bass might have been 71. Anyways, I'm listening to that record. It was very avant-garde. I went back into Japan. And, uh, I was record. I was uh, living and uh, about Miles Davis in Tokyo, thinking that it would sound the same as Weather Report in Tokyo. I, I just didn't know what to expect. And that's when I first heard Tony Williams play Miles Davis live in Tokyo. And it changed my whole world around. So 
you start following what Tony Williams did, and I found discoveries from Boston and took lessons from that in Boston. And I knew then that I needed to get out to Boston. I grew up in South Hadley, Massachusetts. It's about an hour and a half away. And so I started taking let My father would drive me out there once every two weeks. And the things about Alan Dawson was he probably had, let's say, 10 students a day. And it was, if you started at 10 o'clock, you started at 10 o'clock and you were done at 11 o'clock. There was no, hey, Joe, how's the weather outside? Or how's your life? There was no um, buddy, buddy stuff. It was strict lesson. And you'd get down into his basement and there would be a, a drum pad and your knees were basically touching each other and you're separated by the pad. I'm glad I have my sticks with me. And we'd start off with the two rudiments of the, of the lesson. And what I remember most about Alan Dawson was slow down, Farnsworth, slow down, <laughs> slow down for two years. And what he meant by slow down is that let's say you're going to do a paradiddle, okay? He wanted you to do the full stroke, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, slow as possible, not right, left, right, right, left, right, left. If you wanted you to get the full stroke, and so when guys would say, how do you play so fast, is because of Alan Dawson, I learned how to play so slow. So that's that's what I mostly learned from Alan Dawson. He was a professional fellow, and he was from the month of There was no BS, and slow down. Yeah, he was. He played on so many recordings. A lot of the great uh, prestige uh, stuff. Uh, uh, I remember uh, the great Jackie Byer led a quartet with uh, Joe Farrell and Alan Dawson. They they did a couple of uh, live at Lenny's on the Turnpike, which is a great Boston club in that era. Alan Dawson was just incredible. What can you share with us about the great Arthur Taylor? Uh, Brett, well, you're gonna have to. We're gonna have to go till five o'clock if that if you want me to open up, start talking about AT. Listen, I, I I got to New York and AT might have been coming back from Europe around then. He started a group called the Taylor's Whalers. And Brett, I didn't get to see Fitzgerald. I didn't stop anything this in my life on drums. Uh, the, the excitement and the the and how charismatic he was. And then I started listening to all the records, well, Giant Steps, but like Jackie McLean, in the Scales, Swing, Swing, Swinging, the records with Gene Ammons, oh, forget, the Red Garland Trio, just the way he played, he had such style. So I used to stay at my brother's house on the weekends, and there was a book, it was like a phone book from the uh, Musicians Union. It had all the names in the book. Walter Davis, Horace Silver, Sonny Rollins, Jack Dejanet, uh, Billy Cobham, and I would go down each night and just call everybody up. Just Some would hang up on me, some wouldn't answer, and some would actually speak to me. And then I got to Arthur Taylor. I'm like, oh, my God, A.T.? So I called him up, and within a week, I started taking lessons with him. And, man, Brett, I, he lived up Sugar Hill, where Jackie used to live, Monk, Sonny Rollins. He lived right across the street from uh, Duke Ellington and... Um, Oh, the stinger! I just the name escapes me. Those married to Miss Roach. Uh, Abby, Abby Lincoln. Yeah. So I'm up there and I get a little lost, and it's at the, re the lessons at three o'clock. I get into his building, walk down the hallway, and, and he pokes his head out. He says, "Farnsworth." I says, "Yeah." He says, three o'clock." So I learned from Dexter Gordon: if you're not on time, you can't play in time. So immediately, man, the first words out of his mouth were like the greatest lesson. Says every time I'm late for something. The, the, the timing's off. His whole thing was about sound and music and swinging hard and um, and, and, and learning the language of the, of the music like uh, Bud Powell and Charlie Parker. His, he loved Bud Powell. He loved Philly Joe Jones, Kenny Clark, and Bud Powell. And he also loved, um, you could check him out on uh, um, a Gene Ammons record. He loved J.C. Hurd. That's a little sick thing he told. He tried to this after J.C. Hurd. So you can go on one of those Gene Ammons records and check it out. Yeah. 
Well, as we can see, ladies and gentlemen, this is a man who is very much in touch with the history of this music. And he has listened and learned from the masters. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and Joe has also uh, been doing some videos lately. And I want to play a video that he put up a couple of weeks ago that I found absolutely fascinating. My name is Joseph Farnsworth from the Bronx. I'm going to do my very first drum video. I hope it goes well. I was just listening to Blue Gardenia, Diane Washington, where my great friend Cecil Payne takes a wonderful eight bar solo. And that's how he met his first wife from that very song. He follows up Vice Prez. It got me to thinking all the greats I saw play the brushes of ballads. So I'm gonna share with you four. Elvin Jones, Billy Higgins, Art Taylor, and then Tootie Heath. And I'm gonna throw in the Connie K for you, so you got five. Elvin Jones with Hank Jones, Body and Soul at Bradley's. Look at his right hand. Billy Higgins at Sweet Basil's. I'll hang my tears out to dry with Cedar Walton. My man A.T. live at the Village Vanguard. Soul Eyes with Abraham Burton. He kept his brush in the drum. Now we're going to go on to the great Tootie Heath, and this gets a little fancy, people. Here's what he was doing. Almost like a question mark. And now the great Connie K, Westside Condon's with Junior Cook. You leave me breathless. And he was basically playing like a snowman, figure eight with his right hand. I'm going to throw in a little Max Roach. He told me Sid Catlett knocked the bottle over his head because Max was taking the snare brush off the drum. And he said, leave the brush in the drum, young man. There's some rough times back then. So this is Max Roach playing. And he did two, basically, circles, long circles. And he liked to do what Eddie Henderson tells drummers to do, not to clomp down on the hi-hat on two and four. So this is Max Roach and Eddie Henderson. Circles opposite. Trying to just get one long even sound, no high hat. Thank you for a trip down memory lane and how to play ballads with the brushes. Joe, do you think, uh, let me ask you this, why do you think pe people don't play as many ballads as they used to? Is it harder to play ballads? Um, I, I didn't notice that, Brett, but I, I do, I would think that a lot of things today, everything's so fast. Uh, you got to do everything in like 10 seconds. You do Instagram and 50 seconds or people watch it uh so much noise and people want to uh 
uh, that people just want to, they seem like they have a hard time staying still. I think back in the day, maybe they, I think they took their time and they were more romantic, especially with the brushes. I mean, those guys, I was just smart watching it. Not that I'm any good. I just remember the exact moments I saw those guys do it. And A.T. really loved playing the ballads. He was like deep in the drums. And, you know, it, I, you talk about Sarah Vaughn all the time. And when you see Roy Haynes play the brushes, he talked about Sarah Vaughn all the time. The reason why I did the video is because of Cecil Payne talking about Dinah Washington. And I think there was just more uh, people... People were slower back. I mean, people were more calm back then, and I think they had, uh, you know, expressed themselves. They didn't be so jump and you know, things uh, react. So I'm not sure if it's harder to play dolls you now. I think people just uh, a little too excited now. I guess. Yeah, it's it's a reflection of our fast-paced times. I mean, uh, people's attention span is is very short. I mean, uh, you know, with my videos on YouTube, I put up all kinds of videos. Most people don't get past two or three minutes. I mean, you know, it's on to something else. Um, <laughs> but I miss I miss ballads. I, ballads played like by people like Lester Young and and Ben Webster. Uh, there's an emotional content to that music that it's fantastic. I wanted to welcome all our viewers. You know, we have a global audience here. Uh, so far, people have checked it from Scotland and uh, Belgium. And please let us know where you are viewing from. And if you have any questions or comments uh, for Joe, please leave them. If you're on uh, Facebook, you can put them on the page there and we'll, we'll see them. And also, if you're on YouTube, uh, put them on the YouTube page. Joe, how did it begin for you? You say you're from South Hadley, Massachusetts. You come from a musical family. Why the drums? My father, Roger Farnsworth, who's still alive and giving the last, he's a music teacher. And his thing is that he has records upon records in the house. I have four older brothers, David, who's the original drummer, John, who uh, plays saxophone now, but started with the trombone. My brother Paul, he used to play little drums, and my brother James, saxophone player. And so you go up to our house uh, at the top of the stairs to my parents' room. Uh, on a side note, the stairs are wooden stairs, and um, you, we always had, especially when we were in high school, we had to try to get up those stairs without my, without waking up our parents, like without, you know, because the one step would always creak. It reminds me of those Japanese, um, you know, emperor's homes where they, they, they had the wooden stuff where you could hear the intruders uh, stepping on the, the wooden uh, plates and stuff. So you get up past their room, the first room was my brother's David's room, and he had a set of drums. David, uh, he, he used to love, like, um, Grady Tate. He's a very smooth drummer. He doesn't play anymore, but he can still he still has a nice time. He had a beautiful set of Ludwigs in his room, and, I, and I, I, I slept in his room. And so when he'd go to school, he'd look, don't touch my drums. And then I'd, I'd, I'd watch him walk down the street to uh, grade school. And when I couldn't see him anymore, I'd leap up and drum. Beautiful symbol, lovely. And uh, I don't know why, but my father had this speaker that looked like it belonged to Led Zeppelin. It was like 10 feet high, and I would blast like uh, April in Paris or Buddy Rich's well, West Side Story. And just that's why I'd ring in my ears. It'd just be blasting. I'd play all day along uh, to those records. In my brother James's room, he was a transcribing fool. He ended up playing with Ray Charles. He was a tremendous baritone player. But he, his favorite record was like, Sonny Rollins, Dizzy Globey, Sonny Rollins, transcribed all the solos. So his room was like, Sonny Stitt, Sonny Rollins, Pepper Adams, Cecil Payne. And my brother John's room was, um, he was more like uh, John Coltrane, J.J. Johnson, Curtis Fuller. So each night, I, I, I lived on 23 Hadley Street. To me, it was like a little mini 52nd Street. So I'd go, and each room was like a club. So I'd just go club hopping all night long. And that's, that's, how, that's how it started for me. And, and uh, who were the first drummers that you listened to that you, that you tried to emulate? Oh, man, Sonny Payne and Buddy Rich, without a doubt. And then um, 
people in Paris, uh, West Side Story. And then about sixth grade, my brother had a group, John. My brother, David, didn't want to rehearse with them because he was watching General Hospital. <laughs> I jumped into the group. And um, we had to learn Slow Boat to China and Chi Chi. So that was my first uh, uh, diving in experience to Max Roach. Now, Max Roach was also teaching up in Amherst. So my brother brought us to uh, one of his master classes. Man, I couldn't believe we walked in the room. It was just me, my brother, John, and Max. And Max was playing piano. And he looked up and says, hey, son, what are you here for? I said, well, I'm here to learn how to play drums. He says, uh, well, you know how to play piano? I said, no. He says, well, if you don't know anything about Billy Strayhorn, you can't play the drums. And then he just, then he just kept playing for 20 minutes. So I had to sit with that for uh, a long time. I still don't know how to play the piano, but that's my the first words Max Roach said to me. Yeah, that's that's pretty deep. Well, uh, everyone says that. I, I mean, Dizzy d said that as well. I mean, uh, Dizzy uh, uh, was also a great teacher, a master who shared his knowledge. And, he, and Jimmy Heath told me, you know, he would, Dizzy would sit down with you at the piano and show you stuff at the piano. Now, you mentioned uh, Sonny Payne and Buddy Rich, who are primarily known for their big band drumming. Uh, Buddy with uh, his own bands and Sonny Payne, of course, with uh, Count Basie, the great Basie band of the 50s and the 60s. Have you done any big band playing? I'm not familiar with that in, in your in your discography. Um, no, I did it I was in the, you know, high school and then uh, college. And then um, I did a week with Wynton Marcellus, the JALC. It was a tribute to Monk. And uh, I was in China, and I came back that day, and they needed a drummer. So I went in there, and I was I was thinking, well, okay, Monk, big band. Uh, I was, then I was thinking, live at Town Hall, AT, you know, he's on that record. I'm like, how hard can it be? Just swing hard, you know? And then, uh, you know, and I know all the Monk tunes, but they had a lot of young arrangers that <laughs> arranged the heck out of these tunes, man. So evidence wasn't evidence, man. It was like the kitchen sink in there. So I was sweating bullets, man. So now nah, I don't play much big band, but man, I'll tell you, if there's one guy I listen to every day is Sonny Payne, that style. And the way he played shiny stockings alone, man. I mean, that's one guy I wish I could have seen is Sonny Payne, especially live at Birdland. Harold Mabern said, you wouldn't believe the energy, especially when Count Basie was down there in that group with Frank Foster, Frank West, uh, Eddie Jones, Freddie Green. That 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 would be my dream if I could see uh, Sonny Payne play. Yeah. Well, when I was a kid, I was a big Maynard Ferguson fan, and he had yeah, me too. he had two drummers that that I still love and listen to. One was Frankie Dunlop, and the other one was Rufus Jones. Rufus Jones ended up uh, playing with Duke uh, after uh, Maynard had a problem with his hands and, and had to stop at a certain point. Uh, Frankie Dunlop, though, was around for a long time. He was, of course, famous for his work with Monk and Lionel mm. Hampton. And uh, the thing about those big band drummers, essentially the lead trumpeter and the big band and the drummer of a big band really determined so much of how the band's going to mm -hmm. swing you know how it's going to sound uh so i i for one really love uh the sound of a big band with an exciting drummer uh oh i i i the orchestra for three months so that was exciting and when i was a freshman in college you know to me i i just you know when i see someone like sonny Payne and buddy rich rufus speedy jones and those guys i just i, I can't do it man and so um no, I don't. I don't. I've limited experience with that stuff. Yeah. Oops. We lost your. Uh, okay. There. You're back. Okay. Someone. Uh, one of our uh, regular viewers, Yvette, commented uh, that you remind her of. Uh, let me see if I can find this exactly where it is. You remind her of uh, Art Blakey. She says you're so creative with so much sound. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you? What are your thoughts on Art Blakey and and his influence on uh, on drumming? Well, it's funny. I mean, it's 
it's really weird to say, but Eric Blakey could be almost even underrated. I mean, you take him so much for granted. You know, like, oh, uh, Moaning, Are You Real, Long Came Betty, uh, Like It's like uh, you take it for granted just great he is, man. And I was blessed to see him at Sweet Basil a lot. And um, um, uh, what's the, there was a club on 90s in the West Side that McKell's. McKell's. And he, yeah, so I, I, I stopped by there. I couldn't believe the, 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 how big his beat was and how wide it was. And, um, and I really saw him a lot with Essiet Essie on bass. And those two had a tremendous hookup. And, uh, man, just going to Sweet Basil to see Art Blakey. And he had, like, ten horn players on the stage. And he, I, I think his hearing, hearing was kind of shot. So he played really bright cymbals. It was really pounding quarter notes. But, man, it was swinging so hard. And what I got from him mostly was how dynamic was and how we could play those arrangements and bring it way up and bring it way down without losing the um, the beat, you know? The beat was always there, but the dynamics were incredible. Yeah. I mean, not only as a drummer, but as a leader, Art Blakey had a fantastic influence on this music. The Jazz Messengers were one of the great jazz universities. And so many people yeah. came through there who went on to like do fantastic things like Wayne Shorter and Lee Morgan and Benny Golson and Horace Silver. I mean, Hank Mobley, the list goes on and on uh, to up to the later bands with Terrence Blanchard and Wynton Marsalis and Wallace Roney. I mean, uh, Bradford, Bradford and Donald Harrison and uh, just an incredible uh, ensemble. Sadly, because of the structure of uh, the business, and uh, we're talking about pre-COVID here, the cost of traveling, bands don't travel like they used to. Uh, musicians, if they were competent and the circumstances were right, got to play with Art Blakey or Cannibal Adderley or Horace Silver and learn from the masters like that. Now the situation is different. Most of the education comes from in the university settings. And obviously the quality of the education varies greatly depending on who's teaching. Um, you, you came through William Patterson, which has been recognized as one of the better jazz programs. Uh, what do you look for? What do, I'll rephrase that. For young drummers who are looking for a music education program, what should they look for when they're considering someplace to study, especially with the drums? Well, first and foremost, I mean, it's uh, not to open a can of worms, but people like people really dog uh, universities and uh, education like that. But see, the thing is, like, I don't want to get too much into it. Guys like Philly Joe Jones and Josh Train walk on a new city anymore. So, I mean, it's, it's just, just, you know, the university, the streets and all that stuff. It's really not there. I mean, you got Barry Harris. And you have uh, George Coleman, but as far as like just hanging out and, and and learning from these guys, guys like Art Blakey, think about it. What a tremendous leader he is. I mean, because he was he was playing with um, Mr. B in like 1946. So his 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 tremendous leadership goes back, from the, you know, day one. So it's like it's like uh, like Horace Silver, so Junior Cook. These guys passed on all this tremendous list. Universities, like, uh, people complain about some things, but the main thing is, if I'm a drummer, I'm going to go to where the greatest drummers are because I want to study with the greatest. So to me, uh, when I was in 1980s, it was New York City. I wouldn't go out to uh, the Midwest to study because I wanted to be around Art Taylor. I wanted to be around uh, Jimmy Cobb. I wanted to be around Art Blakey, Those guys live in New York. If I was a drummer and going to a university, let's say William Patterson, one of the main reasons I went there was because of Harold Maber. Now, he's not a drummer, but he played with the greatest drummers that ever played. He's also, you know, in the rhythm section. For example, um, I'm watching Harold Maber with George Coleman, Jamil Nasser, and Billy Higgins. 
uh, Harry Bryant's comp. He has to, uh, um, what do you call it, orchestrate. And you could hear it on the video you played. He likes to play like a big band, the Count Basie big band. And um, a lot of times with George, he'll do this Phineas Newborn thing, his triplets, that he got from Phineas and Memphis. Now he's playing that, I'm watching it. And Billy Higgins would you know, swing it and, and do the, the triplets with the left hand. And the, do like two choruses George is playing and the intensity would be sky high until they hit the downbeat and the people would go crazy. And so my first, you know, playing with uh, Harold, he started doing it. I'm like, yeah, man, I'm gonna play just like Billy Higgins did. And I started doing it thinking like, he's gonna love me. And then Harold stopped us and said, young man, don't play with me, play for me. And I didn't understand it then. I said, well, I just did what, exactly what Billy Higgins did, which was obvious because Billy Higgins. But Harold learned that, inset, that, in, um, that inside knowledge that I wouldn't have gotten because he was, you know. And so I had learned my lessons a, a lot from him. The bass player there, I mean, the head of the program was Rufus Reed. Now, we'd play with him a lot, and he'd been playing with Eddie Glenn and Dexter Gordon. So when you played with him, you know, he'd tell you, hey, man, you know, you got to, this is a big lesson for any rhythm section player. You've got to respect the quarter note, man. You talk about not playing ballads today. Young people, and uh, you've got to learn how to play one, two, three, four, one. You talk about playing ballads. I want those slow ballads Dexter Gordon played. So Rufus Reed, He'd say you've got to respect the core note. If you play today, you go one, two, three, and then do 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 one, two, three, and then just spaz out. But those guys, man, they they respected the core note. Those are things that I didn't even learn from drum teaching. I learned from the faculty, and I didn't need to be hanging on the street to you know, learn. I learned there, which was a great setting because it allowed me to practice. So I, I'm, I'm answering a bunch of questions and bringing up some things, but because sometimes universities get a bad rap. I would especially choose a university that has players in it, you know, Harold Mayburn, Rufus Reed. Well, now William Patterson has got a lot, you know, uh, Bill Charlap, Vince Herring, Mike Ladon, uh, you know, lots of great guys, man, Jeremy Pelt. So I'd go to places like that, that, that the people that I admire that are playing in at the clubs are also teaching. I'm sorry if I went off topic. No, no. I mean, I, th I think what you're saying is very important, that uh, you really want to go to the source. And by finding yeah. these musicians, finding these masters, these are, it's going to give you the best opportunity to learn about and play the music. Because it's not only about the music, it's about life itself. Because I'm sure you'll agree with me, musicians have a unique perspective on life, especially... Uh, what I call the older cats, the masters. They come from a different era, a different time. And uh, I just say, back in McLean, you know, you know, it up, you know, what's it called? Mars? That video where he's teaching in Connecticut. Man, I mean, if you can't get a better lesson, I mean, I would recommend all jazz lovers around the world to watch that. Jack McLean on Mars. You talk about uh, the real deal, bringing it to the university setting. So there's no way you could possibly say that universities are the death of jazz. That's impossible. Well, jazz is a dying. The main thing is a lot of those great players and originators have passed on. So it's, it's up to guys like me and you and that, to, to keep it alive. And it's, you know, it's a struggle, but we got to try to uphold that level, you know, because that level is really high. Check yeah. out Jack McLean. I'm sure you have. That's a, that's, that's teaching one on one right there. Yeah, Jackie McLean on Mars. That was a documentary. I think it was done in the seventies, just after Jackie got to Hartford. Jackie made an incredible contribution up there. Uh, you know, he taught yeah. for many years, and, and uh, with his wife Dolly and a couple other people, opened up the Artist Collective, which was in the community. Gave a lot of people the opportunity up there to to study the music. And uh, our friend Javon. Yeah. What's that? I missed that. Happy. Birthday. McLean. All right. Renee. 
Yeah, his birthday is yesterday. Here's a, uh, a comment from our friend Corey Weed. says, I love how Joe is always in a tie. Classy. <laughs> hey, and this. This is a tribute to Art Farmer. Ah, uh, yes, Art Farmer. Now, you mentioned the fact that you could go on YouTube and watch Jackie McLean. Uh, that's the incredible thing. I mean, personally, I have a love-hate relationship with YouTube. I hate it. Mm -hmm that musicians are not compensated fairly for all the videos that people are watching. That is like, I don't want to get started on that. I love the fact that someone who's just learning about the music could go on YouTube and see Eric Dolphy and Art Tatum and Cecil Taylor and Sonny Payne. So I'm going to put you on the spot here. Which drummers that you haven't mentioned would you recommend people check out on YouTube? Well, man, that's an easy one. Kenny Clark, uh, Bud Powell, Kenny Clark with the Francie Bowling Bands, uh, Philly Joe Jones with, uh, he takes a beautiful solo with uh, Thelonious Monk. Uh, I personally love Clifford Jarvis, man. Clifford Jarvis on um, Hub Tones and uh, a record with Barry Harris. Uh, he plays with uh, Sun Ra and Archie Shep. Clifford Jarvis is a bad cat. Those are the things off the top of my head. Hey, and back to Sonny Payne. First of all, there's two that are just absolute stunners. Old Man River with Count Basie, and he does a brush solo with the Harry James Orchestra. And, I mean, you talk about stunning. <laughs> wow. So he plays Old Man River. He takes a solo, and it, man, he's cooking so hard that he starts throwing up sticks. And then, he, and then his technique is... Better than you'd even imagine. And then he gets off the drums like nothing happened. Like, like he's uh, attacked over my God. But he's just like, he, man, he's cooking on there. But I would check out Kenny Clark for sure. Uh, Clifford Jarvis. Billy Joe Jones are the, the main ones. I, well, of course, man, Billy Higgins, man. He's number one. Uh, Billy Higgins done a lot of great the stuff with Cedar Walton. And uh, they have a nice one with Clifford Jordan. And uh, there's one with George Coleman uh, in uh, Perugia. Billy Higgins, man, I saw him about 2,000 times in my life. And uh, he, he was talking about, you know, see, I, there's the Club Bradleys. You could sit there and almost put, you know, put your face on Billy's hi-hat. And there's a table right there, and I'd watch them. And this was a duo room, but they started using drums. But Billy could be dynamic in a room like that. One time I was watching Billy Higgins, and I was sitting next to Max Roach and Bob Hodges. Can you believe it? And me, I was like 19 years old, and I, I couldn't believe it. And they were so excited to watch Billy Higgins. Afterwards, uh, they left. I was hanging out with Billy, and he told me this story. He says, I just want to tell you something, man, that um, a lot of drummers walk into a room and say, here I am, and that's the way they play. He said, Farns was, I always wanted to be one of those drummers that walks in the room and starts playing. And about 10 minutes later, the cast turn around and say, who's that? That was my first conversation with Billy Higgins. Wow. Well, you know, if you go to a lot of those Blue Note records from the 50s and early 60s, Billy Higgins is on so many of them. I mean, and... Always had that smile, nickname, Smiling Billy Higgins. Just a really positive swing in force. Just incredible. I want to go to a bunch of questions and comments here. Uh, first one uh, from our friend of ours in India. Uh, I'm not going to jump to his, uh, the correct pronunciation of his last name. Uh, Sam Shankar would like you to say a few words about Shelly Mann. Oh man, Shelly Mann was great, swinging hard. Uh, he's also uh, he's also on my favorite TV show, Hawaii Five O, and uh, he's a great player, man. I don't I've never saw him live. Funny though, we used to live in the you know, came back to Massachusetts. My mother would pick a place to visit, my father would pick a place to visit, and I would pick a place. This one particular time, uh, we went to uh, Tokyo. And we went to Hawaii, and then I wanted to go to L.A. to go to the manhole, Shelly's Club. Well, my mother didn't want to do that, so me and my father stopped in L.A. 
and to go to the manhole. But <laughs> the manhole was long gone. It was a different type of club when we walked in there. It was like, I can't believe it. The manhole closed like 14 years before. So, but we didn't know this before internet. But God was watching out for us because the next, the next day was the Playboy Jazz Festival. And who do we get to see? Weather Report, uh, Pieces of a Dream, Sarah Vaughn, Dexter Gordon with Woody Shaw and Milt Jackson. Can you believe that? Wow. Maynard. And the next day was McCoy Tyner with Elvin, Ron, and Freddie Hubbard. Oh, my God. <laughs> so I never saw Shelly, but great player, man. Great. Yeah. Barty Lessing has a comment. He says, Roy Brooks hit the drums harder than anyone. Do you, do you, would you agree with that? Roy Brooks, the drummer from Detroit? Uh, I wouldn't, but I, I never saw Roy Brooks hit the drums. So I did see Roy Brooks once on a subway in New York City, and he was carrying a saw with him because he used to solo on uh, like a, a saw. Now, Roy Brooks from Detroit, I know that. And now Junior Cook, uh, he played with him and loved him. I never saw Roy Brooks play, but I, I can't imagine he hit the drums harder than Art Blakey or Elvin Jones. He might have, but I don't know about that. I'd be surprised. He's Nicol swinging his butt off. I'm sure. Nicholas from Chile wants to know, what was it like playing with McCoy Tyner? It was the greatest, most spiritual experience of my life. Uh, right before I got the gig, George Coleman told me, he says, you got to watch yourself because McCoy plays with a lot of dynamics, and he demands that you play with a lot of dynamics. He got to put up with it. And so my first sound check with him, um, he was playing, so I was just trying to be like, you know, I'm going to rock out like Elvin Jones. And, oh, man. Um he couldn't take it, and he stopped the sound check right away. This is my first attempt playing with him. He's like, he asked me, do you know how to listen? And, man, I just shrunk. I got out of that, and we eventually I worked it out. I never met a guy. He would stare at you when you were playing. I posted a picture of him on my Facebook. It's called Look. And he would stare right at the drummer because he was playing right at you. And I never felt that energy through anyone in my life, not Pharrell Sanders, not Horace Silver, not George Coleman. I never felt that energy coming at you like McCoy Tyner gave you. Most spiritual guy, man. And, man, the, the very last gig we did at the Blue Note, he was just talking about how grateful he was that we were to play for the people. He always talked about we, never him. He should have been talking about him because it was McCoy Tyner, but he always talked about the group. It was it was a it was a force, Matt McCoy. We call him the chief. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, not only a musician, but a man of great substance as well. And mm, uh, yeah, you know. Those, I'm, those... I'm sorry. We're playing, and uh, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. And I stopped looking at him, and I looked around the club, and I could feel my energy go down within two measures, and then. I said, oh, my God, I better get back over there. And I went back, and McCoy was waiting for me. Like, stop looking around, man. It's right here. And I never, never looked over. I could be the whole gig staring right at him, you know. I could feel the energy being sapped out of me when I wasn't looking at him. Wow. That's deep, mm -hmm. man. Anthony mm -hmm. Am Amodio says, Tell Joe he needs to make more videos where he runs through the styles of all these guys. Incredible. Are you planning that, that we showed that video before, which blew my mind when you posted that on Facebook, Joe. It was so good. Are you planning on doing more of those? I just did one yesterday and uh, about my first lessons with Art Taylor and how he, I, I asked him how he comps. I wanted to comp just like him. He sat down and talked about Bud Powell. That's all. My first lesson was listening to Bud Powell. And you take the melodies of Bud Powell and you apply it to the drums. That's how you can learn the language of the music. It's through the melodies of Bud Powell and Charlie Parker. He talked about three things, phrasing, rhythm, and swinging. And so I played John Zabby. And I made the video yesterday. And I showed 
where Philly Joe Jones, Lewis Hayes, Kenny Clark, and AT got some comping patterns out of that one melody. So yeah, that was yesterday. So you're, uh, those videos are posted on Facebook. Do you also post them to YouTube? Yeah, I just started, yeah. Great. Fantastic. Yeah, I have a, um, a, a new site, Joe Farns Drums. It's like a YouTube channel, and I got to get people to sign up for it, you know. Okay, Joe Subscribe. Farns. Just, I, I don't know what it does, but you get to a certain point, and I don't know, maybe you get like a, a star or something for getting, I don't know. <laughs> Another question from Anthony. Do you have a favorite ride symbol that you use? Uh, no, I do not. No. Okay. I had a okay that sounded like um, ATs that someone basically gave me in 1986, but I don't know what happened to it. So, uh, no, I don't have a ride symbol I like. Not yet. Okay. Well, uh, I'm sure you'll find one. Um, <laughs> yeah. and I like... Hey, man, I had the best idea. I wanted to go to Zildjian with Mickey Roker. And this is when Kenny Washington was putting out his symbol. It's a dark ride. So my suggestion to Zildjian was, let me bring Mickey Roker. And I loved his symbol sound on Speak Like a Child. And it's an A Zildjian. So I gave him the whole uh, package. I'm like, let's make a symbol after Mickey and say, Speak Like A Zildjian. Come on, Brett. Isn't that genius? That's a very cool idea. You mentioned uh, a Mickey Roker on Speak Like a Child. It, for some reason, I flashed on Tootie Heath on I Have a Dream from Herbie Hancock. Yeah. You know that track? Is playing. Yeah, of course. I mean, the, the thing about this music that, that's always struck me is how an individual can develop such a unique approach and sound. You know, when we listen to the masters... We know them after three or four beats or a couple of notes because what they do is so distinctive. And I think, Joe, that you're going to go down as one of these people, too, because you are part of that tradition and you are carrying it on in a very dynamic way. And I want to thank you for being with me today on the show. We've, we've had people from all over the world jumping in and out here. Uh, and uh, I hope if uh, the uh, stars align properly, you'll be able to come back again sometime. Well, this is the high of my year to be on your videos, man. You're doing a great job. You're an in, in inspiration to us all, man. Well, the it definitely comes from the music. There's, there's no doubt about that. Oh, final question here. How do you stay relaxed while playing at a fast tempo? That's an interesting question. Let me repeat it. How do you stay relaxed while playing at a fast tempo? Um, Simple. Well... Quickly, I practice very slow, like I told you that Alan Dawson showed me. And then at each, after I practice each day, I always play Cherokee as fast as I can. And I trade courses by myself, 16s, 8s, 4s, 2s, and 1s, because when I get on that bandstand with George Coleman, and like he says, hey, man, we're a well-oiled machine. I do not want to be huffing and puffing with that. I want to be relaxed. So I practice very hard every day. And I end with something very fast. And so when I get to play with George Coleman or Pharaoh Sanders, they play fast. It's not a problem for me. And I say, I say a lot of prayers before I go for <laughs> play, play. Yes. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, everyone, for stopping by. Please stay safe. Stay healthy. Uh, we'll be back next week on Christmas Day with the show featuring some highlights of the Mount Fuji Jazz Festival, uh, an event that happened in Japan where some of our greatest masters got to play. Thankfully, uh, it was recorded by uh, Japanese television. Uh, and so we'll be featuring Tony Williams and Herbie Hancock and Freddie Hubbard and some really spectacular music. Thanks again, Joe, and uh, great to see your face in the place. Bye-bye.